here we are in Hope, Arizona. You can see the sign on the building that used to be the local cafe. Uh, I could give you the GPS coordinates of where we are, but unless you're a GPS geek or a weatherman or with the geological survey, that'd be totally boring. So let me just say that where we are is at the junction of Highway 60 and Highway 72. You can see the sign there that says uh, to Phoenix and Blythe. There's not a lot out here really to see as far as it being a town or anything. It's uh, uh, There are a few people that live here. Um, this is the Church of Hope. You can see the sign that says Church of Hope. And I'm just kind of panning just to give you a general idea. Uh, there's a couple of houses here from some of the founding fathers that, uh, that built Hope. And then across the street, we'll take you there in a minute, uh, there is an RV park and it fills up with a lot of Canadians and snowbirds from all over the place, uh, from a deer foot or moose jaw or horse tail or wherever they're from. And there's a shell station, a little gas station and a general store. Uh, they usually roll up the sidewalks at about seven at night. Um, a lot of traffic comes through here, so we're just going to go, go ahead and keep shooting anyway. You'll see cars go by, and you'll hear cars go by, and then, uh, but that's okay. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll get a chance to do an interview with Tom Turner, the guy that owns all this, uh, or Doug that lives over there in the house that I just showed you. And um, anyway, it's unholy hot. Today, I'm going to venture 116 right now. So, um, there's not going to be a whole lot of activity, but sometimes a lot of, uh, a lot of times you'll see maybe 30 bikers come rolling in here. They stop at the little store and get snacks and drinks and get in out of the heat and whatnot. Okay, so here we are in the parking lot between the Shell Station and the other building I showed you. And as you can see, uh, this one is for rent. And it'd be a nice opportunity for someone who maybe wanted to do a restaurant or something. A lot of people stop here. But across the street, you see the, the Ramblin' Roads RV uh, Resort. And anyway, this also belongs to uh, Tom Turner and uh, it's uh, fairly empty right now because of the time of year that it is. And, but this is where all those snowbirds from Canada uh, come to spend their pretty Canadian money. I hope Arizona is a good place to stop in. Uh, actually, where we are is an hour away from Wickenburg going that direction, an hour away from uh, Parker going that direction, and an hour away from Buckeye. This literally is middle of nowhere. And But I want to show you what I think is the real attraction and why so many snowbirds uh, come here over the winter and stay up into through, through spring. Um, let me... Uh, Let's, let's give you a, uh, a panoramic view of, of why I think this part of the desert is so beautiful. This, I think, is the real attraction of why this part of the desert is so popular among the snowbirds and the uh, winter visitors and everything. Uh, we have this beautiful mountain range back here, and I've been here since winter and I've, I've watched this place change it's kind of surrealistic actually there's a way back in the distance you can see there's a, a railroad track and you can see the, the the train come through and it's kind of cartoonish actually but just to give you an idea uh, there's a lot of wildlife out here I've seen javelina I've seen deer, uh, bighorn sheep, 
uh, snakes, lizards, scorpions, just everything that you would expect to find in the desert. Um, look at this, uh, uh, the flora here. There's um, saguaro cactuses, there's ocotillo. Zoom in on these ocotillo over here. There's ocotillo, there's uh, Palo Verde trees, lots of Palo Verde, and believe it or not, at some point it's really green back here. And and uh, if you've never had allergies a day in your life, if you come out here in the spring, you will have allergies. That's for sure. So um, there's several different kinds of acacia trees. This particular acacia tree is called Cat's Paw, and the interesting thing about it is it has two different kinds of bark. It has this shaggy shaggy bark like a, almost like an alligator juniper and as you can see on this uh, sucker coming out here it also has smooth bark as you see up in here in this area as I sit under this tree under the on the weekends um, you can actually hear it humming um, from the bees that are out here and they are the Africanized but apparently this isn't anywhere near their hive I've found that if you don't mess with them, they usually don't mess with you. But at any rate, uh, this acacia tree, if you look here, you'll see that it has these patches of what looks like mistletoe. People call it mistletoe. Um, but this tree is called cat's paw, and that's because of the many stickers that it has, uh, which is typical of life in the desert, whether it's plant, animal, whatever. There's not a whole lot out here that isn't dangerous or has some kind of stickers, thorns, wants to stick you, sting you, bite you, uh, has poison, whatever. Um, but uh, here's some of the patches of mistletoe. And let's go over and I'll show you what's eventually going to happen to this tree because of this, this uh, life form that lives on it. Now, here's another acacia tree. It's a cat's paw just like that other one. And as you can see, it's like completely, completely engulfed with this mistletoe, they call it. Actually, it's not, but uh, it's in the same family. And since it, this tree has been killed by this uh, parasite, and it's still living on it. So not only is it a paras uh, parasitic life form, it's a saprophytic one. And that's going to be the fate of that other poor tree. Now, as you go back up in here, it becomes more and more wildernessy as you go. And really to get out there and enjoy it, you'd need a horse or an ATV of some kind. Um, actually, you could see right over here by the cell tower, there is a sign that says no trespassing, uh, violators will be prosecuted, etc., etc. Uh, however, the guy that owns this property is uh, the same guy that has the RV park and he does let people go back in there. There's a, a whole bunch of mines out there from back during the gold rush days. I guess this place was just crowded with miners. Um, there's Indian ruins, a lot of talking rocks with petroglyphs on them and we'll show you one of those here uh, in just a little bit. But um, I think that whatever indigenous peoples lived here a thousand years ago, this might have been different. Might have had a couple of rivers and a bunch of springs out here and maybe was a little less deserty. Uh, but anyway, as far as deserts go, this is absolutely gorgeous. And so anyway, um, I just wanted to let you get a sense of why uh, this part of the desert is just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and I think that that's the real attraction of why somebody would come to Hope, Arizona. Okay, here is the talking rock I was telling you about. And uh, as you can see, there's petroglyphs on it. Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, petroglyphs are actual uh, written language. There's really no dissimilarity between that and uh, the ones up in northern Arizona, in Verde Valley, uh, Red Canyon, 
Sabina Canyon, etc. Um, in addition, there's uh, uh, a lot of them up on the Hopi Res, and, and I, I think that it was really a written language. They used to think that hieroglyphics, Mayan, and whatnot were uh, were not a language, but uh, they found out that uh, through Rosetta Stones, unfortunately, there's no Rosetta Stone uh, that we can use to figure out what the vowels are or what the phonetic code is. But uh, anyway, they're they're out here and uh, kind of abundant. Okay, here's a here's another talking rock, and as you can see, it's uh, about the same thing as the other one. So this leads me to believe that it is a written language, and we don't know what the, the code, the phonemes, the individual vowels, and so forth, because these people lived a long time ago. But I'm certain it was a language, just like the Mayan hieroglyphics and the Egyptian hieroglyphics and whatnot. They just thought they were pictograms uh, until they found the Rosetta Stone and were able to translate a single story that was told in three different languages. Okay, so we're headed back the other way and there's the sign as you leave the area that says you're now beyond hope.